Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, the 3rd of March. You're here at Lunch and Learn. Uh, hope you're having a good week so far, and uh, hopefully you're in an area where the weather is calming down, and maybe you're noticing even a little bit of spring in the air. I know where we are here in North Carolina, it's been warmer for a couple of days, and a few trees are flowering, and daffodils are popping out of the ground, so hopefully we'll be into some nice weather soon. Uh, today, as you're being unmuted, uh, we're going to just have an open discussion. Uh, Judy will lead that discussion. We're just curious about people and, and how you in particular work with young people, especially kids that are under the ages of five and six. We see more and more of this, you know, happening. Uh, parents are bringing in younger kids with hopes that maybe neurofeedback will help and nothing else seems to have. So that's the discussion today. It's an open floor. Anybody can throw their two cents in. And Judy, I'm going to let you start off the discussion. You know, I'm really hoping that people will share their experience uh, and uh, because I'm getting more phone calls with parents who are telling me about their little ones, three years old, four years old, who are just bouncing off the walls. And um, here's what I learned and what I've been doing. Uh, I'll, I usually don't do full protocols until after like seven and a quarter, seven and a half. Then I can do a map and, and go from there. If they can't st sit still for a map, I, I, I'll start with SMR at CZ and then, you know, depending, move either to uh, like protocol four frontals or protocol four centrals. But these kids under, what I've been doing is if they can sit still or even sit on mommy or daddy's lap, I've been doing uh, like 18 to 20 minutes of SMR at CZ. And um, that's basically it. And I tell them that the brain is in too much flux and change. So what I'm going to do won't hold, but it ought to help for a little while. And then they can come back. and. I'm happy to help them until their child is of an age when we can do when we can do more. But that's all that I've been doing. And so occasionally on this our list serve or I see I'm I'm a follower of a number of neuroscience and neurofeedback groups, people talking about training little ones at C3 or what they're doing. And I just I wanted to toss it around because I need to hear your experiences to know can I expand what I'm doing? Can I offer more in different sites? And if so, why yes? And if not, why no? So that's the direction of the conversation today. You know that, um, and I've had some nice success. I mean, I have helped uh, four-year-olds uh, stop bouncing off the walls as much, and the parents definitely tell me they're sleeping better and everything is a little bit better. So, I mean, we've done that, but I'd like to know what other people do and how you make your decisions on it. So I'm opening it up. That was really well, well organized initial statement, Judy, I like that. Thank you, I've given it a lot of thought. Sounds like it. I just don't know where to go and who to take the uh, advice from or beside you all. You, you are the ones I look to. Well, I know a lot of these people here work with kids and uh, quite often we've had input of people working with two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. Um, some of them may not be on today, but quite a few people out there doing that. Hey, Judy, this is Diane Costo. Can you hear me? I can. I yeah. can. Absolutely. I've, I've dealt with some little ones over the years, and, um, you know, I will certainly try to get a map if I can, but I, I tend to stick with those central lobe protocols as well, the traditional Sturman, you know, <laughs> calming mm -hmm. the central nervous system, you know, maybe a little trying to reduce that impulsivity and everything. And 
yeah, pretty good results. I don't, um, I don't preface it like you have that it's not going to stick or make, you know, long-term changes because I haven't had a lot of them come back and say, oh my gosh, they're totally back like where they were before. I haven't heard that. You know, we've, we've had some good results that tend to, you know, create changes in their life, I believe. Um, so, but similar things, like you said, uh, sitting on mom or dad's lap, uh, weighted blankets, you know, making sure that it's their favorite shows and it's fun. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a little bit of my experience. So mostly in the central area is where you stay? Yeah, I do. I have in the past, mostly, you know, SMR up CZ, maybe SMR up um, Theta down on C3 on occasion, you know, to kind of settle them in on that area. Nope. The youngest we had, and this was totally, I mean, I told the mom, there is no research on this. I can't, you know, <laughs> but, but she had been all across the country, everywhere. She had a brain damaged baby who ended up uh, accidentally uh, having his like airflow cut off for a while. I mean, she took him to everything she could imagine, you know, hyperbarics, all this kind of stuff. He came into us, he was like nine months old and I warned her like, we have no solid research on this, but I'm open to try it if you are. And we did little um, short SMR sessions on him. Um, you know, and we they're not they weren't even sure that he could really see, but we noticed when we turned the screen on that it drew his eyes over towards the screen. So I did auditory and a screen of these kind of videos that seemed to catch his attention. And um, he he calmed down. He started being less fussy. They eventually got the little feeding tube out of him. Um, you know, and it was a very slow, short process. It's not like we did it intensely. It was just over. Um, oh gosh, like a year and a half here and there when we could, we'd do a little session on them. And so, I don't know. I don't know, it's pretty interesting. That must have been very rewarding. It was, <laughs> yeah, she was so excited, you know, and for us to see the, you know, the changes in him like that, but that's pretty significant. And whether, you know, you never know, she's doing everything that she can, but I like to attribute everything that I can to neurofeedback <laughs> because I don't <laughs> So I'm I'm the opposite of everybody else that thinks it's something else other than the neurofeedback. I'm always like convinced it's the neurofeedback. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah, I'm not afraid of dealing with the little ones. I, I think it's uh, like you said, there's more and more of them too. You know, we just we were just mapping a little four year old the other day and a five year old and they'll be coming in because they don't know what else to do. They're, they're out of other options. There's it's hard to find other effective therapies for kids that age. You know, but when they can sit and watch a video and, and start to regulate their brain and calm their systems down, I think it's great. That's my two cents. How long do you train, let's say, your four or five-year-olds? How long do you do um, it? We build up. So I always start everyone at just like a 10 minutes. And then based on how they handle that and how they do, we bump it up maybe five minutes a session. I do that with adults as well. I just feel like it's... a that's the process I'm comfortable with. We don't get, you know, any kind of reactions. Um, so I do, that's what I would do with the child too. I just start with 10 minutes, see how they do. You know, if they're getting real restless towards the end, we'll stick with that for a while. But if they're fine, they're sitting there, they're focused, they're not pulling the sensors off, I gradually build up by five minutes each session. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. The thing is too, when you start short like that, when they first come in and they're a little nervous and uncomfortable and everything, you start short and you, you gradually build up, then, you know, they're, they grow into that comfort level too with you, you know, and they're fine right. and they can tolerate the longer very easily. Right. Right. And you're, it's easy there when they come to me and they start out like today, I had an eight year old boy this morning and you know, you could see he was a little nervous and his eyeballs right. first came in, but mm -hmm. then we just moved into it and we did the map and we sat there together and talked a little bit about doing it. And he was so cooperative. And then um, after this, you know, and of course they've promised him like something special when he leaves food wise. And, <laughs> and I'm telling him about watching his favorite show on Netflix 
next yeah. and you know it's like there i i don't get a lot of resistance around it it's just now nah. uh, you know the how how intensely can i train if they're younger than seven or eight that's what i wonder and that's what there's nothing out there really talking about literature nah. wise Well, I'm, I'll chime in and say that I agree with what uh, you both have said. I've worked with a few kids, ages um, five and six. I had one kid I worked with uh, under the direction of a neurologist that was four doing home training, and mom was trained by the neurologist to how to hook the, the child up. So ran uh, those, you know, home training. But like both of you, I tend to go considerably, I typically start with, you know, you know, 15 or 20 minute sessions. If they tolerate it well and do well, I may move them up a little bit more length of time over the course of time uh, in, in session length. Um, and uh, have had have had good luck working with them. Same tricks for mapping, by the way, sitting on a parent's lap, having a parent tell them a story when their eyes are closed, or even if their eyes are open, watching a DVD eyes open if we're doing a brain map. Uh, if they sit in the parent's lap, the parent can gently put their fingers on the eyelids of the child to keep their eyes closed um, and that kind of stuff. If they have a hard time with the cap, sending them home with an old used cap that I don't use anymore, or giving the parents to say, you know, get a swim cap and have them sit in front of the TV watching a video for 30 minutes with a swim cap on. <laughs> Anything to simulate the uh, QBG experience. I know some people um, were doing a lot of uh, uh, training. Um, for slow or for low training with kids and and uh, felt it was a really good option yeah um I've, I've heard the same richard i am not trained in it and would not therefore even attempt to do it without going through a lot of work with someone like mark smith and i know that it requires, um, you know, the, the patient being able to do some decent self-report and the, and the clinician being a really good observer of physiological reactions. So, um, you know, I wouldn't do it because I don't feel like I'm trained in that particular technique. But um, otherwise, um, you know, using traditional one, two or four channel training, I'd be very comfortable with. Now, one of the things I will tell you, well, I've observed, I'd be curious if others have observed this, Judy or uh, Diane or anybody. Um, training young kids, when I train them at FP1, FP2, I've had several parents tell me they became much more talkative. <laughs> 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 and I had one parent say, I'm not sure what you've done. He used to be quiet. He wouldn't, he wouldn't talk about anything. And now I can't shut him up. <laughs> And I also found that training in FP1, FP2 with young kids oftentimes really fatigued them afterwards. Um, not for a long period of time, but they would oftentimes nap in the car on the way home. And I told the parents, that's fine. Let them nap. That's okay. It just really seems to calm down those really busy brains. Interesting that you say that. You know, I was working centrals to temporals protocol four with a, an, a nine-year-old. And the father reached out to me that describing some behaviors that he was noticing. So, you know, he wasn't necessarily so thrilled because it wasn't talking back per se. It was the kid was having more opinions on things. So he was interested in discussions more. And I, um, I interpreted that as I think as their brains come back on board more, they have to back up and do the tasks of the growth and development that they might not have been able to do when their brain wasn't kind of doing the best for them when they had so much excess going on and when he looked at it that way it made so much sense because that's what the boy was doing he was just catching up and uh and so they stopped thinking something 
different bad was happening, you know, and we've been smooth sailing ever since. So if this is not a topic that people want to talk about, I'm fine with moving on. I mean, I know other that you all have opinions on it, but that's that's okay if uh, I don't want to put the pressure on and keep the silence going too long. Um, silence is a good thing. In 12 step, it's where all the magic comes from. <laughs> Quakers, it's the Quakers. It's not just the Quakers, it's, it's Joe and the Big Book and uh, Native American, and Paul yeah. Simon. <laughs> the list is very long about silence. It goes way back I'll, thousands of years. I'll tell you years. what, you're all going to see when I send up the next Science Daily, one of the topics I thought was really rather interesting. I'm going to pull it up but just to read the, uh, maybe I'll send that out separately. Um, it, the topic is uh, people literally don't know when to shut up or keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is. We, we aren't really good at that, you know, and we're also mostly been put in the role of observers, you know, uh, right. rather than participants. We're an observer culture now because we blue screen everything, you know, we we aren't participating that much except outside of time. Because, so, you know, sociological research says um, if there's a young person in the room with a cell phone, then from a sociological perspective, from graph theory, you may have 15 or 20 people in that room and only think there's one <laughs> because of how <laughs> they use texting. And oh. that's not just, that's not an observation, that's actual theory, that's actual research with experiments. Well, I just sent that one topic out just because it was interesting. <laughs> uh, it's a, this is an important topic. Huh? Uh, you know, people are, uh, we're, you know, we're, the point I'm making with Judy and all this is that, you know, in school, we're shamed from the earliest ages all the way through school for speaking up. And it's always remarkable to me that people spoke up. I taught, I taught um, at uh, graduate and undergraduate classes for, I would say, uh, almost 10 years. And, um, uh, it was amazing. Only uh, four to five percent of the class ever felt encouraged to speak up. Uh, I could sometimes cultivate um, a class, but some of them were really frightened, you could see. Um, yeah. And they required tremendous support and encouragement. Uh, and it, you know, it stays with us, you know, even up through graduate school, I saw the same pattern. And, you know, I can remember being in classes too, feeling like, well, you know, I'm not an expert. And uh, and if you have anybody who's aggressive, I mean, all the sociological research shows that the people who dominate any given uh, group, small groups, is, and I'm talking about even four or five, it's based upon their gender, their height, the depth of their voice, how aggressively they interrupt, and how authoritatively they speak. Those are the factors that term, determine who will be the group leader. It has nothing to do with intelligence, um, nothing to do with skill, uh, nothing to do with an understanding of the issues, which probably doesn't speak well for me or Martin, but it, it's, uh, it is a fact. Besides that, my voice is not very deep. Neither is Rob, and Rob's a little shorter than average, so he's not you know, <laughs> <laughs> hes not going to dominate the group, at least not in the classic way. Um, well, you know, it's interesting, Richard. When I uh, One of the things I, I learned from an uncle uh, who was a golf pro, he taught me about observing things. He would walk around, he says, you always want to take in your environment and observe, you know. And and so I do that, and it's interesting. I walk with a neighbor in my neighborhood, and I'm always pointing out some, someone does something different in their yard or whatever. The other thing I also learned, uh, probably in undergraduate, but it paid off really well in graduate school, is I always began to associate and talk with and hang out with people who knew much more than me. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. And if you do, you tend to listen more. 
If, if you listen more, that's right. And you're taking in a bunch of information. It's one of the beauties of uh, these sessions, uh, these webinars we do is uh, people have great information. They share different ideas. Now we're seeing more people beginning to share articles, you know, in addition to the science dailies I send out. Um, and so, yeah, listening, you, you learn a whole lot. And by the way, I'm sending out another announcement. For those of you that knew Michael Thompson, he was a big trainer at ISNR, worked really heavily in the uh, world of neurofeedback and ADHD. He just passed away last night. Oh. Yeah, I was thinking about Michael two days ago. I was wondering how he was doing health-wise. So that explains yeah. how he's doing health-wise. Thanks for the yeah. Yeah. update, Rob. Um, yeah. yeah, Michael Thompson and Linda Thompson are um, pioneers in the field. Yeah. They were leaders in the field out of uh, out of Canada, and they worked closely with thought technology. And many of you have read their book, which has been published along, just like Rob and my book. Um, yeah. They've been kind of like the two big books out there for a lot of people taking the uh, BCIA course. Yep. Um, and uh, Michael was a doctor, a medical doctor, and Linda's a PhD psychologist. They were a very dynamic and um, productive team and really moved the field forward. And they were real uh, guardians of combining biofeedback and neurofeedback and uh, standard neurofeedback. They really uh, promoted it. And uh, so uh, it's that's uh, unfortunate, but uh, uh, we're all headed in that same direction. So. Uh, that's how it rolls. Yeah. Getting back to where we are, I think, you know, we talk about a lot of topics and there is the, um, um, you know, there's there's a resistance to overcome, to get out there and talk about things. And, um, and I have, I've talked with most people on the Lunch and Learn personally, because I talk to everybody who goes through New Mind personally. And, uh, um, my experience is that most of them just say, well, you know, I just don't feel like I know that much and everybody sounds so knowledgeable. And uh, I often respond, well, they're actually not that knowledgeable. They're just very opinionated, which is fine. And that's all we're sharing here is speculation and opinion unless somebody's citing something. And then we want to hear that, you know, where is that coming from? And I think part of our problem here is what Judy said coming out of the front gate is, uh, she can't find much research on this topic, and I don't think anybody else can. And so we're all at a loss to say things when there's no research on it. And uh, a lot of us have, um, quite a few of us have, uh, I think more than not, you know, have a standard that we don't work with people under six or seven years of age. And that got started with Joe Lubar, who said that he, you know, and that was 20 years ago. I don't know if he has, still has the same opinion. But he had a strong opinion, and many of the uh, senior leaders in the field did at the time, back in the 90s and early 2000s, that um, uh, there was, we, we just don't know enough about the early human brain. Uh, we don't have much research on it or the effects of neurofeedback on it. Uh, we just are, have so much ignorance and that we may be, uh, you know, fooling around in an area where we don't know really what to expect or the outcome or what we're doing. And so he was very hesitant to encourage people to train children before the age of seven, because that's kind of like the early stage of of uh, myelination when people start to get up to eight or nine cycles a second, at least as far as he knew back then. Now, I have a database with over a million maps in it. So I can go and take out, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 people and look at, you know, people coming into a clinic uh, and people who are normal and say, well, what's typical? And I can tell you, um, and, and I don't see studies with the numbers we have, but we, I see these studies coming out where they're, oh, we had 100 people, we have 200 people, and we looked at their norms uh, from our town, you know, or, or our university area. Well, you know, I have 30, 40, 50,000 people I can grab at any time from all over the United States going back for 10 years. Um, uh, so I can tell you statistically that most of the kids by the time they're seven to eight all have uh, dominant frequencies of nine cycles a second or faster easily. It's more like 9.2 if I remember right was the mean. 
So that's universal, but we also know universally that under that age, there's a big variation. In fact, all the way up to nine or 10, there's huge variation. I mean, that's the mean, but that's not the variance. The variance is wide. I mean, the, the differences are all over the map until you get to like nine or 10, and they really don't settle down till puberty. So, you know, all the databases do all of this finagling to get, you know, sliding windows and, you know, Manaholobus distance calculations and all these other exotic things to kind of try to invent some kind of mean and standard deviation, you know, in spite of the variance that would be clinically meaningful. I'm not impressed, um, but what would I know? Um, and uh, so, because, you know, I don't have a PhD in statistics, uh, it's just in social psychology and research. But I would say, you know, we just are pretty ignorant and even the maps are, you know, we don't know how meaningful they are. And, I, and so, I, you know, I think to anybody to rush in and say they absolutely know something has got to be premature if that's the case. Now, I can see if you had a lot of confidence, if you did something clinical and you have observed many times improvements, that's great. Um, but you have to remember the law of averages says you can be on a winning streak for quite a while before you start, you know, using a craps table, same as neurofeedback, it's just statistics. So I think we need to be cautious about finding a protocol that we espouse with great confidence. And I haven't heard that, so I'm not saying that about anybody. But um, at least with standard neurofeedback, we know what we're doing. We somewhat know what the norms are. We know what the history from the uh, medical EEG books are. We have all of that to draw on. If you're dealing with infraslow or infralow, we don't have that information. We're not even sure what those things are doing exactly. But in my opinion, that could be valuable because you're working at sub-delta frequencies and you're working on um, uh, more like what the astrocytes are producing in terms of frequency range, as far as we know. And um, that's an area where the brain is developing and there's robust activity down there that will influence the brain a lot. And so I think if they could just get more research on that area, that might be useful. Whereas the adult brain is producing a lot of higher frequency activity. And if you look at the phylogenetic scale, uh, that frequencies below theta dominate the mammals. Well, once you get uh, a cortex and you start to getting into um, apes and other anthropoids, you start getting higher frequency activity. But of course, it's not to get to the human cortex where you got intense social interactions. Um, a lot of the researchers in, uh, you know, in the field of epistemology and scientific epistemology and uh, sociology of knowledge and so forth, um, they argue very strongly, you know, based on their research, that we developed the cortex mostly for purposes of communication and that what we call um, narrative and knowledge is basically a social event. It's not like physics, which is a mathematical event, um, but even physics is somewhat of a social event, and that we evolved our frontal lobes for the purpose of sharing stories and information and arguing, and that it's through argument and stories that we organize ourselves. So it, it's very much, if you don't have good abilities at arguing and sharing, you're in trouble. And now that gives us a basis for looking backwards in development. We know that most kids develop um, the majority of their emotional uh, scripts before the age of one and a half. They learn that from the family. Uh, they can't even develop a narrative till they're three. They don't even know that they're a separate self to their two, two and a half. So you can have a whole emotional pattern based on your family and not even know where it came from. Uh, that's kind of a handicap if you're going to talk therapy. Well, tell me about your feelings. Uh, I don't know where they came from, Doc. Um, uh, and you wouldn't. And so there's limbic structures that we might be working with when we're working at before the age of six. And they would be in the theta frequencies 
based on what we know of human development and mammals. Uh, all of that is, and you know, 90% of our processing is subcortical. We don't even know who we are, what we're thinking most of the time until it comes out our mouth. And like a little bird on the top of a whale, you know, chirping, you know, let's go this way, let's go that way, and we don't know why. Um, so there's a huge subterranean process of development before we get, you know, to these ages of uh, fast mapping at five or six when we really develop language and narrative abilities. I think Joel makes a good argument based on that, but we have frightened parents, right? And I was a parent, I understand. You have a kid who's out of control, two or three years old, you're overwhelmed, everybody's angry at your kid, and you can't find a place for him. You know, your Mont local Montessori says, sorry, you know, this is too much for us. Um, you can't, hard to find babysitters and keep them. Um, the children um, are hyperactive, oppositional, a handful, um, and the parents can't sleep. They're desperate. The kid's wrecking the whole family. He's only three years old. The parents, you know, the mother may even have to stay home. And they come to you and say, help. And you're like, oh, my God, what am I going to do for this poor person? So, of course, you want to reach out and help them, right? So I'm just talking through, from my clinical experience, what I know a lot of you are going through. And it's in the shared experience that we find our wisdom and direction, I believe, through our narrative. And um, we don't know that much, but the things I've been talking about, we do know. Um, most of the people who are doing standard neurofeedback that I've heard are like Judy and Diane. Um, we, we just don't, it'd be irresponsible to say we know what we're doing. So all we can say is, like Judy said, well, um, many clinics have done some basic neurofeedback and it's helped, but it's somewhat experimental. Uh, we can't guarantee anything. Um, uh, as far as we know, it doesn't cause any harm or side effects, but we just don't have a lot of research on it. So the parent then makes a decision. Well, this is basically a training, a learning process. It's not an intervention. It's not invasive. It's um, not highly manipulative. Um, you're not with a talk therapist who may be impacting the child one way or another. Uh, certainly, if you have a child with a problem, I would be hooking them up with a child therapist. Um, but I know a lot of parents say, well, I tried that. It doesn't work. It can work better if you have neurofeedback, but also, there's a lot of people who say they're child therapists but aren't really that well trained. So you really have to. Sandra, I'm I'm actually a child therapist. Fantastic. A... Speak up, please. Oh, good. I I am. Um, my practice is a pediatric practice, and so we do our our neurofeedback is primarily children. Um, what I'm looking at for the younger ones is, and I don't have this yet, um, but I'm, I'm just ordering it, is starting off with the safe and sound protocol. Okay. Um, for, the, for the little ones, we see a lot of kids uh, who are diagnosed, well, and we also, I have a psychology clinic, and so we combine, whenever we do neurofeedback, it's always combined with therapy. Um, and so that's just how we do it. And um, so that family part, the uh, the play therapy part is for the for the younger kids is play therapy is part of what we do as well, and working with parents. So we really do try to do a holistic biopsychosocial intervention and track of goals that way. Well, that, that's um, very interesting, uh, Cassandra. Um, Tell me, um, what's your opinion on who should be doing um, work with, with really young ch children? And um, uh, do you feel that play therapy is really optimal? Uh, well, all of the people in my clinic are either psychologists or provisional psychologists um, or interns who are doing their, their master's in counseling. So that's who's doing it in my clinic. Okay, great. How long have you been using neurofeedback? 
Um, I, I dipped my toe in the water back okay. in 2013, uh, well, but I, I wouldn't say that we I wasn't very confident with it. So it was just sort of um, messing around with it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so, and at that time, mostly I just did training, you know, um, over the, over the uh, Century Motor Strip um, and still saw some some positive results with that, but it's it's been these last couple of years um, that we've been doing more with it, and we've been having some really great results. I would say our average our average typical client would be uh, a kid between um, eight to ten years old that's got some sort of difficulty with attention regulation would be our our typical. Uh, you dropped out on my end for a second. Did you say how old and ten? Eight to ten, but That's we ten. do we do training with kids. Five would be less common, but we have, um, and that's when we do have the kids sit on their parents' lap. Um, we had one little guy with autism, and that was really common for him to sit on his dad's lap um, during the training, and you know he tolerated it well. And I would say. We've been really working to evaluate progress, um, and we're getting some we're getting good results. Um, most of the training is gonna. Let's see. Well, you know, we we actually do, um, and this is. <laughs> I don't feel I've got a lot to learn with selecting protocols. Um, so we do actually typically follow what is recommended in um, as the, the, the recommended protocols um, or yeah unless something else seems to make more sense um, and that's just my probably my lack of skill uh, I doubt experience it. <laughs> not skill experience yes. <laughs> um, but they I mean the protocols often make sense as long as they make sense for the goals that we have we try that out, and if things aren't working, then we then we do something different. And you we also like look at training times. You sound like you're in Canada. Are you from in Canada? I, I am. I'm in Alberta. <laughs> All right. And so what? Um, so you haven't done much below the age of five. I'd be interested in in um, uh, why that is, or what your thoughts about that were, since you specialize in kids. I mean, you certainly know a lot about them. Yeah, I would say. Um, it's probably because um, when they come to us, we're if they if they're coming to us early, um, we're, we're not going to um, immediately start off with neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's sort of a strange idea to a lot of people, so yeah. we might start off with something else first, and then um, and then later move into neurofeedback. So we might help them with getting some of the environmental stuff at home under control first, for example, um, or getting them some supports at school, um, and then work on the, the, the training with neurofeedback. Well, what do you think about working with children younger than five from a professional perspective? Do you think that's a, a risk, or is well, it something that you're I, I'm less, hesitant to less jump into? With it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we we have done it, um, but I guess from my perspective, I would like to see some of the other foundational things built first, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why I'm leaning towards maybe starting off with the safe and sound pro. That's just that's my idea right now. I haven't I haven't had a chance to implement sure. that. But it makes sense to me that that would be a good place to start, um, especially when we just think about even just. Uh, you know, a hurdle for these for these little guys, um, and especially if they're really dysregulated, is being able to sit in a chair and have stuff on their head. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the challenge, Stefan. <laughs> yeah. So well, sometimes we're fighting laugh. against it's a powerful it. spot to keep them in definitely. Yeah. Like I was just looking at a map today uh, of a of, of a little one who's seven. Um, but she she really really struggled, especially with the eyes closed map, um, and she was so tense that I mean we did our best, but 
it was just really hard for her. Yeah, I'm not sure how realistic it is to get an eyes closed map from really young children. I think just getting an eyes open map is the most you're going to get a lot of the time. It's yeah, like we definitely kid. had that. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, even so, I, I think, you know, I can think of a little guy that we've had who was uh, very developmentally delayed and still, even though the map was hard for him and the training was initially hard, uh, he made some great improvements and his entire, he had a speech therapist and an occupational therapist and a physiotherapist um, all working with him. Uh, but they were all separate and they were separate from what we were doing and um, all of them when i surveyed them said you know we don't we don't know what happened like he just suddenly started making improvements and they all thought that they were superstar therapists which i'm, I'm sure <laughs> <they> were. <laughs> but what the feedback when i when i showed his mom the results of what was what his brain map was looking like she said oh it's kind of like like the soil got more fertile for things to be able to grow and i and i said that yeah. That's, that's what I think happened. It's a great phrasing. Yeah. And, and this is, uh, we all see this in neurofeedback quite often. People are doing all these things and uh, over and over and over and over, and then there's not much change, and they come to the neurofeedback, and suddenly there's a big change. And they go, like, Well, it must be that new therapist we got, or the um, breakfast cereal we changed, or something <laughs> like that. But it's never the neurofeedback until something goes wrong. And said, what's that neurofeedback doing to me? <laughs> oh, my kid. <laughs> I've got a, a few questions. Yeah. Sorry, I had to jump in, but I think time's almost up. So <laughs> so, so here I go. Um, I, I usually see some children, and I just um, focus with the parents on, on okay, let's um, um, reduce the sugars and eat a lot more eggs so they have enough um you know better food and vegetables stuff like that and also the play therapy um later in the day because they're more um like i've learned from your videos richard they're more um compulsive right they're more uh, doers than than you know they haven't developed their front frontal lobe really so so it's like i i review what they like doing and stuff um as in legos or playing with the ball and just like combination but there is this case that I'm probably going to brain map this girl that's six years old because she fell from a, um, from a slide at the park and she fell on the back of her head and she couldn't see for a few minutes. Okay. And um, yeah, and her, her, her dad said that she, uh, she started getting hyper emotional. So I said, well, I think in this case, yeah, we we're going to have to brain map her. That would be a good option. So I've been kind of um, building a strategy. She's going to be, I'm going to brain map her on, on, on Saturday. And well, I was thinking, you know, um, she's six years old. And I think the, the, the database is seven years old enough, right? No, the database goes so, um, to uh, five. Oh, OK. OK, that's that's good news. So um, okay, that's that. That was my first question to know if it was even you know worth it to um, to have a comparison, and well the 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 reading, and so I was thinking okay I'm gonna look for hotspots particularly and maybe just um, an inhibition protocol if I see something that's really jumping jumping out at me and saying like you know this this doesn't seem right at all because I'm not sure even I can train, because their fast frequencies would probably be high theta, like you're saying. So I'm not sure if going beyond probably CZ and FZ, um, unless there are these like hotspots and just thinking about, you know, if there's way too much delta, just trying to inhibit those, those zones due to inflammation or something like that if that makes yeah. any sense i think it does i think if you see something really uh where you're seeing two standard deviations out where you're seeing yellow because the kids can mm -hmm. vary quite a bit but if you've got using the database and you see areas that are yellow you know you can look at the numbers too um if you know how to and if, you know if the, they're often three four standard deviations above normal 
um, I mean, it's, it makes sense to train that down because that's not typical. But I would only do something that was really significantly out because of the variance in the population. So I think you got a point there, definitely. How long okay. ago was the injury? Um, uh, about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, so um, since it's been quite a while, I, I thought, well, I've read some a couple of functional neurology books and it's they just continue that way. It just doesn't go away. So I was like, okay, so probably just um, a little bit of intervention, try out neurofeedback would help. So I, I'm going to um, um, pay the Disney channel or the Disney, you know, so they can so so she can be watching cartoons and stuff like that so she doesn't lose you know um um focus or i'm gonna try it you know <laughs> and uh as a in, attention wise and what i usually do what i started doing now is i have the first session with the protocol i um, um i design and see how they're responding to it and constantly asking, you know, um, and I notice, you know, faster waves or slower waves to see if they're getting drowsy, they're getting tired, muscle tension. And then I change the, um, the, the reinforcement threshold. If it's too hard from 75, I go to 80 or 82 or where they start to like, I, I see the brain waves moving to um, a good direction, but not wanting to overwhelm them so i don't know if what i'm doing is usually um much of a common practice but i that's what i'm thinking about doing so i can get the most time you know 15 20 minutes out of it or see how she responds yeah yeah the old days we used to um we didn't have video, so we were just, you know, trying to train a, a, a really younger kid was difficult. With video, it's much easier. You can capture a child's attention pretty early and get them to stare at a screen and uh, do, you know, what we call involuntary training, which is what mostly we do with screens. So that's reasonable. I think, you know, what you're saying is reasonable. We also find that we we have to be careful with the videos with kids because sometimes they get so excited that it actually um, is a problem. Yes. So it's, it's <laughs> there's a tipping point um, with with the video, and so it's it's finding something that's engaging without being overly exciting. Yes. This is with the adults too. No, you can't watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre three. <laughs> it has to be a documentary. <laughs> Not we've started no <laughs> we've started to really check and make sure the kids aren't picking things that are going dark light dark light too fast you know some of these um anime are are just too dark and oh interesting yeah we're we're watching those kind of things like the the marvel characters mm. a lot of those are filmed dark so and then yes. i had a the little boy today wanted a uh it was uh a souped up car thing, but there were all these lights. So it was light, dark, light, dark. So we yes. we're like watching the videos with them for a few minutes to see, is it going to interfere from that perspective, which I hadn't considered for some time, you know. You bring up a really good point. Mm. And while you're on that topic, I, uh, something came up the other day. Um, you know, the default on the New Mind um, video was, uh, not what I originally wanted or intended. It was uh, another group designing it at the time, uh, uh, so I, who was putting in design requests and somehow it got stuck on there. But I'd like to just forewarn everybody, you should be having that video, uh, the low point on it at 10 or 15. It shouldn't be on, it shouldn't be light dark. Um, we've seen for decades that um, that's not as effective as having it get, get um, you know, somewhat dark and somewhat light. Going on off may seem, you know, appear to be effective because it's so dramatic, but in fact, it's not as effective as having uh, a more gentle on off. So, you know, we, you should be somewhere like 10 or 15 on the low and, you know, 50, 60, 70 on the high. So you're getting a nice range, but, you know, really sound 
light, even photic, dramatic, intense stimulus is not required for the brain to learn and often is counterproductive. So I, I just like to bring that up. We'll be changing that default setting uh, in the next release. Um, finally had the time and space to do that. Uh, but just wanted to give everybody a heads up on that since we're on the topic. So it's more proportional. Yeah, and, and with the kids, it's really hard on them to have it go on, off. You're going to uh, overstimulate them. <clears throat> okay. well, a lot of people also just find that the on and off is just, it's too, it's frustrating. It becomes frustrating because they can't see it all. And it goes too low, so I think it makes better sense to have it milder like you're describing. Yeah, if you have sensory integration issues, you're defeating the purpose of doing neurofeedback. It's like you might as well just keep them in the waiting room. Uh, you know, and uh, it's a been it's an ongoing myth and difficulty we've had. You know, and it's, um, psychophysics. You know, it's in it's, it's basic psychophysics, but if you don't know that, you just make the assumption is bigger is better, more dramatic is better. I mean, we. We tend to be that way as human beings. Higher doses, give them more. You know, Scotty, give her all she's got. We're gonna move this, We're gonna move this kid. Okay. And um, one, one, one last thing. Um, are any of the protocols really a little bit helpful for sleep? Because I tell the parents, you know, your kid should be sleeping 10 to 12 hours, right? So you can they can have all these different activities um well you know um building blocks and stuff like that so they start get worn out and they develop their brain a little bit better but also with things like this where they hit their head so hard um you know they have to sleep a lot so i'm not sure if I'm well, doing it on cz will have an effect uh, i'd like to address that concept to begin with you know what works for sleep what works for ang anger, what works for jealousy, what works for denial, what, you know, we're getting into, then we start to get into phrenology there a little bit, I think. Uh, I try to shy away from that um, one size fits all, you know, uh, you know, take an aspirin for this and an Advil for that and a Benadryl for this. Um, the complexity of the human brain is so high. I think um, the research in TBI kind of hints at that when it tells us that when uh, you have a brain that's um, traumatized, at least physically, mm -hmm. it can cause problems with memory, with anger management, with mood, with attention, with uh, hearing, um, with sensory integration, and that as people heal, all of those things get better, more or less, and it's different for everybody and different degrees. And that, again, pushes us back to the concept of the brain as a system, and what we're looking for with the map is the area in the system, which is, I uh, got too much noise, it's, it's inefficient, and so we want to improve the efficiency in that region of the brain so that the whole brain responds and begins to work well, because frankly, we don't really know that much about the brain at all. Is as proud as everybody in the fMRI community is, the people who really know are quick to point out that you know we're still beginners in this, and uh, I think we have to have the same humble attitude in neurofeedback that you know look at the map. If you don't have a map, as we do with the kids a lot of time, uh, you can get a map, but you're not sure what you're dealing with because kids mostly have delta and theta. Well, delta and theta, that's like you know two and three standard deviations outside the normal might be a reasonable place to start, um, but you don't want to necessarily train too heavily with them because that theta and delta that's normally high in kids likely has a functional purpose, as Martin would say, biologically, and uh, we want to leave uh, room for the brain to develop on its own schedule. So I think we just have to be um, careful. You know, implement basic protocols. I think everybody here uh, has mentioned, who has talked, and I've heard this going years back, that SMR training in the motor strip seems to be a reasonable thing that usually results in improvements with minimal side effects. And 
that's not one person or one clinic, that's hundreds of clinics over decades have reported that. And just on, on the Lunch and Learn alone, Rob and I can tell you, they've been telling us that since 2008. And we've had hundreds of people <laughs> through here. So I think you're pretty safe with that one. And Ms. Judy, I think, just sized it up at the beginning. Yeah, well, I think her statement about what she's doing is pretty conservative, pretty responsible, and yeah. pretty safe. I agree, Richard. And one I would add to the question is, with kids, I seldom train eyes closed. And so yeah. I do use the MAPS protocols. And I found even training eyes open with different protocols and different sites, it tends to help them sleep better. I have a bias about wanting to train eyes closed and then and working more towards the back of the brain and not the frontal lobes for sleep. Yes. But even with kids that I'm training uh, eyes open in the frontal region, they've reported, you know, even like at three F4 protocols that their, their sleep is improved. So I think you're fine using the guided map, but like Richard and Judy said, if you really want to target sleep, eyes open or eyes closed, SMR, it's easy, hard to go wrong. <laughs> okay, great information. Yeah, if anybody has anything, anybody has anything that they know of more or resources, please post them on the list, sir, you know, if you've been hesitant to uh, contribute here. Um, and often we see that space that people will um, have a piece of research that they've got squirreled away or something that's useful that uh, we could use. So appreciate the input we got. We're at the top of the hour. This was really very, very uh, um, validating for me, and I appreciate it. Diane, Cassandra, Yannick, thank you all for pitching in in the conversation. Uh, I know we all appreciated what you had to say. And if Cassandra, if you ever want to put together a little something about like what happens when they come into your clinic, what they do first, second or third, you know, uh, we would, I think we would all be interested in hearing that, what that's like on a couple of cases. Definitely. Because kids, it's, you know, I think that for most of us who are not like you, we all deal here and there with kids, but not as a specialty like yours. So we'd love that. Yeah. Thank you very much for today. Yeah. All right, everybody. Let's uh, get back to work. <laughs> yep. See, See you all Friday. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.